so today um, I'm going to be talking with Tammy Lenski. And uh, many viewers of these videos will know her from her publications, her books, from her extraordinary blogs, um, and from her presentations, and uh, from the both intensely um, and intellectually strong work that she does, along with her playfulness and her stories. So, welcome. Thank you. That was a really nice intro, Michael. Thanks. Well, it. <laughs> it's a chance to uh, acknowledge you. You're welcome. So, as you cast your mind to the sort of the state of affairs of our field, um, and thinking about your history with uh, with mediation and conflict resolution more broadly, are there are there issues that that you see that uh, or concerns or topics that you'd like to focus on in our conversation today? Yeah, there's one in particular that's been on my mind a lot in the last few years, and I I find myself mulling over it a great deal, and um, you know I. I, I your book is about becoming good, right? So in my mind, becoming good as mediators, as conflict resolution professionals, is about um, our ability to raise up our clients and help them bring their best work to the table. There's a trend that I'm seeing in the field, and I'm seeing it uh, in, the, uh, in workshops and conference presentations and things I see people writing online, that seems to be focused on diagnosing people with problems, emotional problems, mental health problems, and then treating them. Um, in other words, managing their problems. Uh, a lot of the uh, things I'm seeing focus on personality disorders and things like that. And I am so deeply troubled by that. Um, that I would love to chew that over a little bit with you today. Uh, because I think it goes to, at least in my mind, the question about what it means to become a good mediator. Yeah, and, and I appreciate that. And also something that you, yes, let's definitely explore that. And one of the things I want to mark as we talk about it is that um, so often when we talk about excellence in practice, what we're thinking about are all of this toolbox full of skills and techniques and so on. Mm -hmm. And we think about it as we becoming really good. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you added is about uplifting the clients so that they can be at their best, whatever they are capable of in that moment, whatever exactly. they wish to be, that we support them in maximizing that opportunity. Yeah, you know, I used to say to my mediation graduate students, no one wakes up the morning of a mediation and says, you know, I want to act badly in public today. I want to act badly in front of my mediator. I want to act badly in this, in front of this person that I am in conflict with. No one does that. Um, now, some listening might be thinking, well, they're acting badly despite themselves. But I actually think that the job of the mediator is to um, help them bring the person they want to be to the table. And there are lots of ways to do that. Right. Well, let's talk about both sides of the equation then. Um, yeah. Both talk about what we can do um, to uplift them, to support them. Um, and at the same time, um, the challenge that, uh, that you described with mediators thinking that the way in which to do that is to diagnose and then treat them. Mm. Um, talk a, a little more about how you see this playing out, um, the, the second part, the part that troubles you greatly. Yeah. Um, I, I was thinking in preparation for our conversation about the question of what's giving rise to this seemingly increasing interest in uh, addressing people with personality disorders and other kinds of mental health challenges in the mediation room. And there are a few things that come to mind. The first is that uh, there are some structural culprits in this. 
uh, the places and the forums, the arenas in which people are mediating, in some cases, in a lot of cases, but certainly not all, are have um, rigid boundaries around time al allowed for mediation, the amount of energy a mediator can put in for the small court affiliated fee they may get. So there are some structural reasons why people feel pressed to hurry through dealing with that soft, messy stuff by figuring out this person's acting badly, therefore they must be a person with a problem and I'm gonna manage them so I can get to the business of what I need to do. So I think uh, in certain spaces, the structure of the way mediation works in those spaces contributes. I also think it's about what we think of as our job. You know, if you think of your job as, a, 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 as being getting to an agreement in as efficient a way as possible, in as little time as possible to maximize your returns and take the heat off them, then there are certain things you're going to do as a shortcut. And dealing sometimes with the messy, soft, emotional, whatever the word is that people want to use, stuff takes longer. Now, I would argue it's uh, you slow down to go fast, right? You know, you, I'm not looking to try to get people to agreement. I'm looking to see if people can discover a lasting agreement. And to me, those are very different things. I also think um, there are ego issues involved. You know, when we say someone's not acting in the way that I want them to act in this room, a lot of us don't want it to be about us and what we're perhaps not doing. So we turn our attention to what their flaws are. Another, I would say, is this, I think, really important question for the field about who's, who should be diagnosing any kind of clinical mental health or emotional kinds of disorders. And it certainly shouldn't be mediators. Uh, it certainly isn't part of our job. And the vast majority of mediators out there aren't trained to do it. They do not have the clinical backgrounds to do it. Wish I have a doctorate and I wouldn't do it. My doctorate is not in psychology. My doctorate is not in psychiatry. Uh, and I, I'm concerned that the proliferation of a lot of these kinds of um, workshops and ideas for managing people with all of these behavioral problems encourage people to diagnose where they and step into territory they don't belong in as mediators. So that's sort of the structural stuff uh, and sort of the, um, our own stuff, our own baggage that we're bringing in in places like that. Did that address the question you were trying to get at? I think so. And there's so much in there to talk <laughs> about as well. Yeah. And I also think one, one piece that maybe that I think is subsumed in what you've, you've said. And that is this notion, I think it comes from the field of appreciative inquiry, that what you focus on becomes your reality. Mm -hmm. It does come from there, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. so if, if what you do is say, well, I know I'm not a, uh, a mental health clinician, but I, I have had some training in identifying certain kinds of personality issues. Let's not call them disorders because, Perfect. yeah. Because most of them aren't, right. Um, so I'm now starting to look for those because <clears throat> I've got a new tool in my toolbox to be able to help them. And no matter how well intended that, that process is, it nevertheless falls into doing exactly what you just described. Um, it's another form of that or, or another element of that structural um, condition that, that we find ourselves, that, that some mediators find themselves in. There's actually a really interesting piece of research that speaks exactly to what you're talking about, Michael. Um, it's called, uh, the, the researchers who did this work initially was back in the 70s, but it's been replicated a number of different times since. And they use the term behavioral confirmation to describe. We, have, we see a behavior, we think, huh, I think I know what that is. I took a workshop about that and I have this tool in my toolbox. And so we start engaging that person as though that behavior, that guess that we've made is, is accurate. And lo and behold, do they not start to exhibit the very behaviors that we think we're seeing. And uh, the classic study about this is one where um, college men were given photos 
of a woman that they were going to have a phone call with. They knew nothing about these women. They were given photos of them. And then they called these women and had conversations with them. And that was the research. What they didn't know is that the person they were talking to was not the person in the photo. <laughs> and what they also didn't know is the women didn't know anything about what the call was about. They just knew they were getting a call from a guy. And there were also people who were going to listen to the conversation later who knew nothing about the setup of this and uh, make some judgments. And what they discovered is that when men thought they were speaking to a, 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 a stereotypically attractive women, woman, the women reacted in ways that the later listeners viewed as stereotypically attractive, gregarious and friendly and humorous and so wonderful. <laughs> and the men thought they were engaging a, a stereotypically unattractive woman. The listeners later gauged these women without again knowing who they were, what they looked like as being probably unattractive, stereotypically unattractive, terse, not very friendly, um, timid, all of these sort of traits that we, can, we associate with unattractiveness, fairly and unfairly. And um, that, that just blows my mind. I remember first reading that study years ago and thinking, how is that possible? You know, so the woman picks up something in his, the way this guy's talking to her and becomes the person he is projecting her to be. I mean, how is that even possible? But it's been replicated actually even with things like expectations of hostility. So if someone goes into a room expecting someone to be hostile to them, amazingly, that person becomes more hostile to them, right. not because of anything necessary about the person. So when we go in and making these assumptions about people, we're playing a role in their behavior, perhaps, in ways we're not even ever going to be conscious of and might like to not acknowledge at all. And, you know, I wonder, uh, because this, this points out, it seems to me, one of the dangers of, of providing people in a well-intended, thoughtful kind of way um, with um, information about personalities and personality issues without correspondingly teaching them that they might come up against the kind of condition that you've just described, mm -hmm. that they need to be guarding themselves against the possibility that they are implicated in some way in the person's behavior. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Yeah. And you know, you said something I want to grab hold of too. Uh, this is not ill-intended. You know, I do not believe that mediators who are sitting in on these workshops and trying to get these, this information, these strategies, these tactics, these tools, have any ill intent at all. I think it's quite the opposite. Right. They are hungry for figuring out how to handle significant behavioral challenges in their mediation rooms. And so I think the fact that there's a hunger for that tells us a lot about our culture, perhaps. It certainly tells a lot us a lot about what our mediation education and training uh, should be doing perhaps more of. Um, but I never believe that people who are doing this are, are in there thinking, oh, those idiot personality issue people, I'm going to go in and I'm going to show them who's boss. No one's thinking like that. Um, but the side effect is that we're helping create a, sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy, perhaps, in some of the behavior that we're attempting to deal with. And we're also, um, we're putting ourselves into a job that uh, I have real doubt we should be doing. So in yeah. terms of treating, diagnosing, and all of those kinds of roles. Yeah, it's a, four, I wonder, maybe I, maybe I don't understand the principle well enough, but it, what I'm thinking of as we're talking about this is the notion of transference and counter-transference that can mm. occur in mental health um, deliveries. You know, that, um, that there's some, I guess the point I want to make without necessarily having to use those words mm. is that that there is an interactive quality to the transactions and the interactions between the mediator and the parties. And that, um, you know, I, I've had uh, training in systems theory and one of the, one of the principles is 
that each person in the system influences every other person in the system and in turn is influenced by every other person in the system. And it's another way of, of describing the conditions that you're talking about. Yeah, I, I love the richness of all of these. If we could sort of take all of these together, I think they do a good job of sort of talk, uh, getting our hands around what we're trying to think about. You know, there's another way too. Um, I was just rereading last week uh, a, one of my favorite books. I re reread it every six months or so because it gives me more food for thought. It's called The Power of P Moments by Chip and Dan Heath. Uh, a, two brothers, both I think professors, they've written a number of, of bestsellers around behavioral stuff. And The Power of Moments is this idea that uh, what people remember later after something are the, uh, is a powerful moment of an interaction. They don't remember the whole interaction. They just, you know, it's that old, um, who was it who said this? They won't remember what you said, but they'll remember how you made them feel. It's a little bit of a version about that. And the idea is that we can play a role in helping people's defining moments be fabulous. And I fear that with an approach, a, a diagnostic approach to behavioral problems, um, that we're actually setting people's up to finding moments as not feeling great. And I don't feel if I have a particular need that mediators need to make people feel great, but I would love people to emerge from the mediation room not feeling put upon, battered, emotionally downtrodden, um, uh, any more than they already do because of the conflict or the situation they're facing. Yeah, uh, one of the words that, that um, a dear friend of mine uses um, often is that they emerge with their dignity intact. Yes, absolutely. And that's another way of, um, of describing it. It isn't that we, you know how <laughs> the conversation in, in the field about power balancing and you know whether we empower, nonsense, we do not empower people. No. And anybody who thinks that is, is running roughshod over people. And in the same way, we can't make them feel better. No. We can support them. We can make them, them feel worse. <laughs> we can, that's for sure. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but as you started out our conversation, you talked about uplifting people in the mm -hmm. sense that you help them achieve the best they can achieve for themselves in that moment in that time, in that space, on that day, in that context, in their lives. Right. That's what we can do. That's um, right. We can't make something better. We, as you say, we can make it a little worse or a lot worse. We can make them feel worse. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, you know, I think, well, can we talk a little bit about what, what we think it takes to become good in this way? to Definitely. raise people up uh, because I, 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 as I was thinking about our conversation, I was, I was realizing that I came into this work having been an educator first. I was in higher education, I had been a dean, I was a VP at the time. And so I come at conflict resolution with a little bit of the sense of what makes people learn, what helps learning, what helps, um, address challenges, what helps them be open to new ideas, what help, all of those things that, that people who teach and understand how people think and learn and change behavior know how to do to the degree we can ever know. And I realize that philosophically, uh, this is an argument m m as much about philosophy as it is about tools in the toolbox. So, you know, if what I always want to say to people is, make sure that the way that you're working, regardless of the way you were taught, is a match with what you believe about conflict, about people, about people in conflict. So for example, um, a phrase I use a lot is that I'm looking for the equal human in front of me. When I go into the mediation room, or I'm working with someone in, in a coaching capacity or consulting capacity around conflict, I'm looking for the person who is uh, equally flawed, equally perfect, equally wonderful, equally awful in moments, 
I, I'm not sitting in a chair that puts me above them in any way as I'm working with them. And philosophically, if people believe that, and I don't know that everybody does, but if you say you believe that, then to work in a diagnostic capacity around uh, their flaws and their problems, maybe that comes from a good place, but I think it trips over into the, uh, I'm a normal person and you're a person with behavioral problems, and I'm gonna help you fix that in this little time that we have together. And that's, you know, so I, I think it's a philosophical argument first or, and the need to reflect on what we believe, right? And I don't think we do very much of that. I don't think, I think mediators probably do it, you know, at 2 a.m. when we're thinking about a case, but I don't think it's, it's heavily involved. It, I don't think most training does a lot about that because training typically doesn't un, unfold that way. In master's programs and bachelor's programs, perhaps there's more of that. I hope there is. I know some programs do that. I, I don't, couldn't possibly know what they're all do. But you know, I think about what's the nature of conflict? What's the nature of our job? What, it, what, it, what does it mean to become good? All of these things are work we have to do on our own as you make the case for in the book. Right. And, um, and then making sure that we're working in alignment because everyone we take a training from doesn't necessarily come from that same orientation. Right, which, you know, I, I love the work that um, uh, Chris Argerus and, mm -hmm. and Donald Schoen did about espouse theory and theory and use, you know? That's right. And that if, if there is this disconnection mm -hmm. between who we really are and what we really believe and how we act, our actions are gonna be awkward Right. We're going to feel off balance and um, we won't be as strong and as capable. Um, you know, that's why I, uh, yeah, I, I it, it's also why it's so difficult to offer people advice mm -hmm. rather than helping them discover what's true yeah. for them, what matters for them. It's that, you know, it is that, um, that we cannot know, you know, when it, if you went to a five-day training with someone about X topic, even after five days, you're not the trainer. Mm. You know, she or he has evolved to, the, to a certain place in their professional life mm. um, as a result of a variety of factors and influence and forces and wonderful things and struggles and so on that you haven't participated in. Mm. You're getting a somewhat of a synthesis of who they are through what they're telling you. Right. And so the adoption of these um, ideas or methods really requires what you're talking about, which is the us to decide for ourselves whether we're integrating any of it, whether it makes any sense given our philosophy about our work. Right, right. And what is the philosophy of our work? You know, for me, it's looking for that equal human. It's about working with people and not on them. The minute I tip over into using a technique, using a tool uh, as a way to sort of get someone to, I'm starting to step over a line that I'm personally uncomfortable with and that I don't need to step over to raise them up, right? There's another thing philosophically and, um, you're going to, speaking of Donald Schoen, one of my favorite books is a book that you referenced in your book, and The Reflective Practitioner, which I first read when I was getting my master's and I had to read again in another class in my doctorate. And I, my copy is so worn. And he talks about the swampy lowlands. Right. Do you know, remember, can I, do you mind? I actually printed this out. No, please. Can I take a minute and read this? Because I think it, it, in a lot of ways, it goes to the heart of what we're talking about. Yeah, my dog eared copy is right behind me. I should have, mine's up on the shelf right up there. So Sean said, in the varied topography of professional practice, there is a high, hard ground overlooking a swamp. On the high ground, manageable problems lend themselves to solution through the use of research-based theory and technique. In the swampy lowlands, problems are messy and confusing and incapable of technical solution. The irony of this is to be relatively unimportant to individuals or society at large, however great their technical interest may be, 
while in the swamp lie the problems of greatest human concern. The practitioner is confronted with a choice. Shall he remain on the high ground where he can solve relatively unimportant problems according to his standards of rigor, or shall he descend to the swamp of important problems where he cannot be rigorous in any ways he knows how to describe? Nearly all professional practitioners experience a version of the dilemma of rigor or relevance, and they respond to it in one of certain ways. And he goes on to say more. But um, I think, I think the, the work of the mediator is to descend into those swampy lowlands, the places where things are messy. There is, um, there is only so much technical, only so far that technical expertise will bring you. And then the only tools you have at that point are your philosophy of the work, right. what you believe about humans or don't believe about humans and conflict and all of the, those kinds of things. And, and, your, and your essential curiosity yeah. that allows you to mm. um, ask questions where you clearly do not know the answer, right. where you're just sort of wading into that swamp with the, with the parties and mm -hmm. saying, the more I get to understand what's happening for you, the better I am able to help you do what you say you want to do about being in this lowland, mm -hmm. about getting out of the swamp or finding a way to drain it or whatever it might be, because that's, that's their choice. That curiosity is essential, Michael. You know, when I'm faced with a behavioral challenge in a mediation that I, that is either getting in the way of the other parties, uh, is getting in the way of perhaps that person bringing their own best thinking because they're swamped emotionally, or it's somehow interfering with what my work can be. I can't, I'm not able to do what, in the face of what they're sending me. Um, my first reaction tries, it, 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 if it's not my first, it's my second, I've taught myself to do this, is to not say, oh man, here we go, I knew this was coming. I had heard that he was like this. <laughs> it's instead to say, huh, what's that about? Uh, wh what is that? Right. Hmm. What, why, what's happening there? And, that, and not to say, okay, what's happening there is they have this problem, that problem, this problem, but then to say, how can, I, how can I understand enough? How can I be curious enough to understand what they're experiencing right now so that I then can help figure out with them how I can support them to make different behavioral choices in those moments to the capacity they can at any given time. And if they can't, what does that mean for continuing today, continuing tomorrow, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And, and let's, I, I wanna be clear about something, just sort of bracketing this mm -hmm. as, we, as we go ahead that when we're talking about the swampy lowlands um, and when we're talking about um, parties behavior in mediation that's challenging to deal with, we are not necessarily limiting our conversation to those types of uh, mediations um, where people would tend to be emotional, right? Like family disputes. That that, our, that what we're talking about is as relevant to a commercial dispute, a workplace dispute, a oh, community, or any other kind. Because I don't want viewers to think that you and I are just talking about, oh, they must be thinking about people getting a divorce and they're, you know, and that's not at all. Yeah, it's not. And most of my work is in the workplace environment, is in the organizational environment. And uh, this very much applies in those settings. I also want to say, you know, swamp has, because of their current political culture, swamp has a different um, sense to it that when, than when Donald Schoen wrote the reflective practitioner that I was quoting. And he does not mean swamp is an awful place where creatures come out of. He's talking about it being a messy, muddy place where things are more difficult. It's harder to walk the terrain, is how he meant it. So we should bracket that as well. Yes, that, that it's a place of um, uncertainty. Right. Um, yeah, it's uh, unpredictability of surprise. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's, I think, that's how I interpret what, uh, and that, that's how I've 
taken his words and used them in my own work. Yeah. 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 And, and I think that if we were, you know, you started out talking about the, the problem of people believe, mediators believing they should be diagnosing in some way, small d, diagnose. Right. Um, we're not talking about clinical definitions or, you know, the, the DSM manual, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. But even label, let's call it labeling even. Mm -hmm. Uh, because that may be that may take it away from any suggestion about uh, about a clinical diagnosis mm. that that the labeling is the kind of thing that takes place on the high ground mm. um, and that's what I think Sean is talking about that if you that you label a problem or you label a behavior in a certain way mm. and then you step back and you say. I have tools that address that definition of the problem. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yes. So what do we do, Michael? How do, how, for people who are watching this, what are we, they're thinking, okay, fine. I still have challenges in my mediations. I want to be able to raise people up to be, to be, bring the best selves they can in that moment. Mm -hmm. um, how do I do that if it's not helping them, helping prevent the, the worst of um, um, themselves coming out, right? So can we talk about that a little? It's the question that was on my mind <laughs> to ask you right now, sure. So yeah. part of it's a training and education question. Part of it is developing uh, the, a deep set of skills and ways of being as a mediator uh, that uh, give you a deep enough, and I'm gonna use toolbox in, in a broad sense, mm -hmm. not a tool that's a technique that we can pull out and use, but a tool in sort of how we think about our work, but, and a toolbox that enables you to um, go deeper when you need to. So part of it's a training question, and, and not defaulting to a, a slim set of tools and techniques and strategies that you've learned and use again and again and again because they've stood you well, they've, they've served you well. Uh, but to take the kinds of trainings where mediators and trainers and teachers are teaching you how to deal with the emotional stuff, the behavioral stuff, what a lot of people call the soft skills in a slightly, sadly, I think, de deprecatory, mm -hmm. not nice way. <laughs> the word was deprecatory, I agree with you. <laughs> um, that somehow the hard skills are the real work and the soft skills, well, when we have to. And I would seek out trainers and teachers who work with those quote unquote soft skills, those dynamics skills, and deepen your toolbox around that. Um, go ahead, you add one. What, what and then? Yeah, you know, I, I agree with you um, completely. And I had um, uh, one of the reflective practice groups I lead, there was somebody in there who was talking about uh, the, the issue that, that, that the person brought up had to do with um, being in the role of an advocate in the middle of a mediation. Mm -hmm. and, um, and understood as the conversation unfolded that there was a fundamental trust issue between mm -hmm. the parties. It was a commercial dispute. And that if the trust issue was not at least addressed and opened up, no matter what else happened to it, um, it was gonna be much more difficult to get to the substantive pieces that everybody in the room wanted to. Right. And this, the, the, the mediator acting as lawyer in this particular case raised the question with the mediator who said, we don't deal with that in this room. This is to deal with, we're here to talk about the numbers or whatever it was that was. And that's an example of the problem that, that you're, you know, that, that we have to help mediators understand that, that what they're dealing with are human beings who have a problem that not just a problem that has to be dealt with. 
that there are both sides of it, I think. I agree. I think too, as we see mediators increasingly move into arenas that are not about separating and going your separate ways, whether that's grievance and uh, you know employees who are helped out or um, divorce or business, dissolution of business, but they're working, moving into territories where people are staying in relationship, professional or personal relationship, either because they have to or because they want to, that calls upon us to be able to deal with that stuff because right. the most perfect technical agreement in the world that doesn't address first major trust issues between business partners, I think that kind of agreement doesn't have great hope for standing the test of time because all they have to do is go out of the room and start doing all the distrusting behavior that they've been carrying around for a while and that agreement starts to become undermined. So uh, again, as mediators move into, if they're working in an arena where people have to be or want to be in some kind of continued personal, professional, business relationship, what it is, we have got to have uh, people developing these skills and nurturing these skills and being willing to open that box of messiness that is the swampy lowland that Sean talked about. Yeah. You know, the, another piece that I would add is the, um, that, that addresses the structural challenges around mediation that has been, uh, you know, in certain, in certain arenas, it's a very specific way that mediation may happen, may not happen, things, rules around what can be done, what cannot be done. And so, for example, if I'm mediating with folks, I'm mediating, let's say, two business partners who have very different opinions about the direction their business should go, and the business is in jeopardy as a result. Before I sit down in the room with them, I am having extensive conversations with each of them individually. In, you know, we, depending on who trained you, it's called intake or pre-mediation, but it's not pre-mediation to gather information and give information about what will happen. I use pre-mediation as, as a, in, a, in a way that I'm sure you do too, which is about helping prepare them to come to the table and anticipate where some of the challenges behaviorally and emotionally are likely to be. So I'm asking people questions like, um, when she gets under your skin, what does that look like? How will, when is, are there times when you just cannot stay in the conversation because you get too frustrated? What does that look like? How will I know it's happening? When you are feeling like you're, she's under your skin and you're losing your, your cool, however that may be, you know, I always joke, when I lose my cool, I'm like this. When my husband, who's from the Midwest, loses his cool, he looks like this. So losing your cool can look all sorts of different ways, right? And everything in between. <clears throat> I'm I can saying, identify as a fellow Midwesterner. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I'm saying, help me think about these things and let me help you think about them so that we're anticipating them again to the degree that we ever can. But I'm also, as a result, I'm building a relationship with them that I can then rely on in the mediation room when I need to do something to intervene in something that has become a problem. So how we use pre-mediation, how we use conversations with clients outside of the mediation room and between sessions, all of that has a profound impact on addressing some of the kinds of things that we're talking here today. And for mediators who are building programs in court settings and, uh, or other in organizational and workplace settings, you know, you gotta be thinking about this um, for the, all the reasons we've said. And, and Tammy, there are going to be situations, structural situations, that that viewers of this are going to say, well, all great. She must be dealing with really rich people. <laughs> <clears throat> a, it's private. They can afford it. She doesn't have to deal in a court system and so on. I don't want them to dismiss what you've just said mm -hmm. that simply because what you're describing can also occur in the middle it's as part of a mediation, even one that's constrained in time. That's right. It's the question of, it goes back to what you were saying, it's our philosophy. Mm -hmm. It's what we believe about our role mm -hmm. that determines how we interact with the parties, whether we have the opportunity to do it in advance. Right. And some people might, might describe what you do or use the label conflict coaching. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, in terms of the pre-mediate, whatever, it doesn't matter what word 
It's the behavior we're talking about. And it's not just the behavior, it's the purpose for your behavior that's in service, going back to what you said at the very beginning, of mm -hmm. uplifting right. the parties so that they can be active, engaged, self-disciplined, they can listen clearly, they can speak articulately, and they feel that sense of dignity. Right, right. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. There are certain things that we can get, to, that we get to do in private mediations that other settings don't. But, you know, if I'm mediating in probate court uh, and I have six siblings uh, arguing over an estate uh, and I can take them aside uh, individually and have the same kinds of conversations that I'm talking about. If I'm seeing, you know, so, um, it can happen in all sorts of settings. It's got to, it, but it is, it goes back again to what you believe, what you consider important and what you consider to be your job. Right. And if you see your job mm -hmm. as in the way that you described the pre-mediation, if that's part of your job, not pre-mediation, but right. the way in which you interact with the parties and the why, not just the what, but the why you do it, then you can bring that into the mediation room. Right. You know, I, I have mediators who have said to me, I, I can't do uh, that work outside the room because I can't charge for that. And I'm, there's only so many hours I'm going to give away for free in preparing for mediation. And that always sort of blows my mind because it makes an assumption that the work of the mediator is done in the room right. and only in the room. Right. And what I think we're talking about is in the op places where we can do it outside of the room, outside of formal sessions that are joint sessions, that we, why wouldn't we charge for that? They're, they're, it, we're implying that those conversations don't have value. And I'm trying to make the argument that they have incredible value. And in fact, when we have the, when we work in arenas that allow us to do that, some of the best work gets done in that kind of place. The other thing, something you just said, made me think of another criticism I've heard from mediators who say, well, that's all well and good, but I don't know how to be a conflict coach. I don't know how to help people uh, bring their better selves to the table. And there, I, I guess I have two responses to that. One is what I've already said, which is, well, then get training in that. Get training in helping people bring their better selves to the table. Search out the trainers and the teachers who will do that for you. They're out there. And then the second thing is, if you're mediating and you have any decent training at all, you know a lot about how people act in conflict. And if you are just going in there and having a conversation around what's happening for them, taking it face value, helping them think through how you can be helpful, what you would, they would like you to help them do and help them avoid doing, how to know when a, a, a big blow up might be coming or an icy cool down is coming again, depending on the person. Mm -hmm. You don't need, and you know a lot about people in conflict from your mediation work. It's just applying it one-on-one -on -one in a conversation that is purely exploratory and to use your word from earlier, a curiosity conversation. It's a, hmm, let's figure this out together. This is what I'm noticing. Is that what's happening for you in those moments? Right. You see, because I think maybe this is where, because we want to talk um, in, the, in the time we have um, about solutions mm. to the dilemma. Um, I think we've, you know, Tammy, you and I know that, that we could go on and on about both elements, both how the problem manifests, but also how we can find solutions that are readily at hand. Mm. Um, and, and I think that one of the things that you've talked about may be a piece that should be incorporated into all training programs mm. and certainly um, those that are supplemental to a basic, but I think even at a basic level, which is what you've talked about as your philosophy. Mm. That, that could you imagine as part of the, the traditional, typical 40-hour training, that at some moment, the trainer says, all right, 
I want you to pick up a pencil or pen and a piece of paper, and I want to write down, want you to write down your philosophy about conflict and about mediation and about your role. Do it in bullet points if you want, outline form. I really don't care, you know. Tell a joke, write a story, doesn't matter, but I want you to imagine what that would do. Mm. Because I think that's, if that part isn't addressed, then what you described about pre-mediation and how the ideas of that could be used inside a mediation setting are going to be lost. Right, right. And there's room for that. You know, even if, if I'm picturing the trainer sitting here thinking, well, in 40 hours, what is it I'm getting rid of? Send them home to think about it. Come back with three things you believe about people and conflict. And let's talk about that. And it allows it to have airtime, which is really crucial. It, you know, it also occurred to me as I was listening to you, Michael, <coughs> that there might be someone listening to this saying, but you're saying there's a correct philosophy. And the correct ph philosophy is that people are inherently good, uh, that people want to be raised up, that um, blah, blah, blah. Everybody is decent. And my philosophy is that not everybody's good. People will sink to the lowest common denominator that they can or whatever they're thinking. And that you're saying that that shouldn't be the case. There probably are mediators who think that, who believe that about people. I certainly have talked to a number of mediators over the years who started in other professions that have jaded them about people because they see people frequently at their worst. Um, I think we can guess what professions I'm largely talking about. Um, but, you know, when I have had these conversations, even with jaded mediators and said, let's back up, let's back up, let's take out, take yourself out of your setting and the people you're interacting with as a result of your work. And I want you to think about your family, your neighbors, your best friends, the people down the street, people everywhere, people you are behind line. Do you believe that about all people? And I think that probably most people would say they we generally do believe people are inherently good. I think mediation is a real burnout career if you think people are inherently bad. Right. Um, so I'm, I, I guess what I'm trying to sort of get my head wrapped around is, is there a right philosophy? I don't think so. I think working consistently, as you pointed out, so that there is not a sort of a, a, a rough point between what you say to yourself that you believe and the way you're actually working as a mediator. I think that kind of congruence is really crucial. And I suspect that the vast majority of people listening to this are uh, of the ilk that uh, uh, most of us have flaws and most of us have off, uh, awesome parts. Mm -hmm. And uh, we want to raise up the awesome parts and help people figure out what to do about their flaws in the heat of the moment, in the difficult conversation, uh, so that it, those things don't weigh them down needlessly. Yeah. You see, I, you know, I, I mostly agree with what you've said. Um, well, I, no, I, I, I do agree with what you've said. I don't need to qualify it. Me mostly, that's okay. No, I know, but I'm, I'm just realizing I don't need to qualify it. Uh, <laughs> not, just to, not just to be nice or friendly or what, because it's true. Because when I've asked um, mediators to do an exercise like the one I described, where they, um, you know, based on the, my first book that, uh, that Allison and I wrote, she mm -hmm. had this idea about the constellation of theories. Uh -huh. That was brilliant. Um, Very. Yeah. And, and so when I ask people to identify their constellation of theories, I give them some examples from me. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I always talk about is that I enter into mediations and working with people from a hopeful perspective. That is that I believe, it's not that I necessarily believe people are good. I believe that people are capable of mm. being good in the, in the broadest sense of the word of good. Mm. And they're capable of acting badly, even as they try to do something that's constructive and positive. That's right. And, um, and it doesn't, yeah, so <clears throat> I have an optimistic frame. Mm. that I bring. 
Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that that is really important. Mm -hmm. if, if we don't believe in that, but in the potential of human beings to be able to do something for themselves that's constructive and positive, our work is really, really a slog. You know, you just said something that also, I, I hadn't thought about this before the conversation, but you just caused me to uncover another sort of belief I have about me in my work. And that is, I'm not the savior here. You're right. You know, I think uh, it, uh, I am, when I do my best work, I think I'm fairly invisible in the room. I'm not the shining light in the room who's going to save them from themselves. Um, I am, the, they are the stars in the room. And again, philosophically, people don't have to disagree, don't have to agree with me about that. But I'm realizing that um, part of raising people up is allowing them to be the stars of their own uh, moments, their own memorable, remarkable moments. Right. And I think, you know, that um, I can speak as a, uh, as a lawyer, uh, non-practicing, um, that lawyers like to think of themselves in heroic terms. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I made this happen. I did this. I was sharp. I was clever. I was um, brilliant. I was insightful. Um, uh, all of those things. And when you listen to lawyers who are mediators talk about their work, often, um, and I don't want to castigate lawyers, that's not mm -hmm. the, the point of this, but often they do see themselves as the agents of something having occurred. And, and that's their philosophy in a way. They don't necessarily articulate it as such, but that's their, their mindset. That's the framework that they bring to their work. That, that I am, the people there and their problem are the ingredients. Mm -hmm. I'm the chef. I'm going to make something quite remarkable out of what they've done. And you and I have a philosophy that says, no, this is not about me. Mm. Um, my practice needs to be um, effective and resourceful and resilient and all of those things. But in a way that when the people walk out of the room, what they think about first is what they have achieved, right. not what I did. Right. Right. And, you know, I would broaden that to certainly beyond attorneys. I know plenty of folks who hail from professions that aren't the law who uh, do come in and strut. But I also think there's sort of a place where that happens. You know, when I go to the national conferences, um, I, I try to avoid all the strutting uh, conversations because they just drive me wild. I just don't care. Um, and when I get mediators who I've seen strutting, you know, over cocktail hour, uh, you know, uh, and I, if I get them quietly by themselves and they're strutting with me, I'll often say, where do you doubt yourself? And I think all of those people have always said, oh, I have so many doubts about mm -hmm. what I did and how great I am. And so I think partly when mediators talk about their work with other mediators, there's a certain um, cultural norm around ain't I grand and showing how good I am. And it's less of a cultural norm to say, oh my gosh, there are days they should not allow me to use the word mediator to describe my work, right? And I would love there to be those cultural norms as well, where we can say, how could I have helped them shine their lights brighter today? And we can talk about that stuff out loud. Certainly forums like your reflective practice mm -hmm. uh, group I think those are the kinds of places uh, that um, are optimal for that. I would also like to see at conferences and uh, those kinds of settings that be uh, embraced because I think that's really where so much of our learning uh, comes is, is being willing to be as flawed as the people we just were in the room with and, and learn from that and not just show how great we are all the time. Yeah, and you see, for me, it ties together, which is the that in order to continually learn, I need to be continually curious. Hmm. It's when my curiosity drops off that I fall back on um, 
everything that I know and assume that that's sufficient. Yeah. 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 And it leads to, in my mind, at least, it leads to conditions where we are susceptible to labeling people mm -hmm. rather than engaging with them mm -hmm. um, because it's easier in some ways for us to do that. Um, it, is, it is easier and it feels efficient sometimes. And I think it, it, we trade uh, short-term efficiency sometimes for long-term effectiveness. And you know that's obviously not what we, I want to aim for. But yeah, I agree. Yeah. So Tammy, um, before we end, um, is there anything either that you want to add or a question that you wish I might have asked you? Oh, good question. Um, I think the only thing I would add, it goes back to uh, our, the part of our conversation where we were exploring um, how people can get better at this, at this becoming good by figuring out how to raise people up. Right. And one way, you know, we've all had a certain, uh, people my age and younger and older, I get, yeah, people around my age were pop psyched into sort of oblivion. For, you know, from the time I was young, there were all these pop psych things, books and TV shows. And, you know, I remember seeing when I was a little kid, uh, some TV show where couples were hitting themselves up with what hitting each other with what we would call pool noodles now, you know, and explaining why venting is good, which now we know venting is a terrible thing to do, uh, right. creates all sorts of other aggression. Um, but when we fall into the trap of thinking we know, we figured them out, we know why they're doing that. We've made an assumption and we're making now a story up in our head to support that assumption that we ask ourselves, what else could this be? It's one of my favorite questions that we ask it of ourselves. We can ask it of our clients too, but to be able to say, well, that's one way to understand what's happening. What else could it be? Because so many of the behavioral challenges that we face uh, that, that, that get us stuck or get our party stuck can be explained in so many ways right. that are beyond uh, labels and disorders and issues and flaws. Uh, those are some of the explanations, but there are so many other ways that those behaviors are reasons that those behaviors are manifesting. And so when we as mediators can just challenge ourselves to step beyond the initial a narrative we've told ourselves and push ourselves to think beyond it, that'd be great. Right, because once we establish that narrative, it becomes fixed in our mind. Absolutely. It becomes fixed in their minds that that must, and the condition that you described before in terms of those research studies applies not just to behavior, but then to outcome as well, it can. And then we've created our own little special dynamic. <laughs> <laughs> with our parties, you know, yeah. it's inevitable anyway. Uh, but I really want to try to keep that dynamic dynamic. I want it to be a moving as opposed to a, um, a fixed narrative that I, I now know the path, you know. So. You know, one of my um, one of my challenges in life um, is saying goodbye. Mm. <laughs> I am famous for um, uh, uh, standing at a doorstep saying goodbye to people for 30 minutes. Um, and I'm not going to do that here. Um, what I am going to say is that what I wish, um, I hope people um, uh, watch and appreciate um, our conversation and all that you've had to say and, and the important ideas that you both presented and the questions that you challenge us with. And um, my thought as we're doing this, and this is part of my own issue about saying goodbye, is let's do part two mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and talk further about some of these things. Mm -hmm. It's been fascinating and wonderful to see and speak with you, Tammy. Michael, it is, I don't get to talk with you at length as many times as I'd like, but I always look forward to it because I always learn so much and you pique my interest about things and uh, get my brain going in all directions, which I love. Great. So thank you. Thank you for inviting me. We've to got do this, this mutual admiration thing going. I'm going to stop the recording now. <laughs> <laughs>